good manager will get results, but burns their people out or doesn't develop their people. Great leader will also get results, but at the same time will develop their people and focus on leading people and motivating people and giving feedback to people. And that's the difference between being a good leader and being a great leader. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hi, and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. It's Rick Nusky. Thank you very much for joining us, and thank you very much for your support of the show. Now, today, I'm inviting back Mr. Stephen Howard. How are you, Stephen? I'm wonderful. Rick, how are you doing over there in Australia? Excellently. Thank you very much. Now, you and I were just talking about the the lockdowns and everything else that's happened Mm. since the last time we spoke. I think it was in 2019, mid-2019. I would say so, yeah. Yeah, and things have certainly changed since then, not only from our uh, <laughs> a lifestyle perspective, but also what you're doing in your business. Now, for everybody uh, who uh, doesn't know much about Stephen, you soon will, because he's an award-winning author of more than 21 leadership, business, and motivational books. And he's also just released a new online education program called The Art of Great Leadership. Now, Stephen and I are going to have a, a deep dive conversation to, into many of his uh, much of his work, including his authorship uh, and predominantly the online education program. But for those who don't know about you, Stephen, I think it's important, if you could, is to just share a little bit about your background, where you are and, and what you get up to. Well, I was born in the United States, uh, went to the, right to university in the U.S. and uh, was recruited out of college. Uh, actually, grew up in Las Vegas. I went to D- Dallas, Texas for my first job, and they sent me to Singapore. And I ended up living in Singapore for 21 years, worked for four different um, multinational organizations. And then I moved to Australia, moved to Victoria in 2001 and lived uh, uh, just outside Melbourne in the countryside for 12 years, uh, running my consultancy business in Asia. And then I moved back to the U.S. about eight years ago. My dad had some health issues. I thought I'd come back for six weeks or six months to help him out. And, end up staying he passed away about four years ago and i've just ended up staying in the united states uh, that's kind of where my business network now is i kind of lost my business network in australia so uh yeah when i basically teach leadership programs obviously as of february 2020 uh, we haven't been in the classroom so no. i pivoted pivoted and uh, <laughs> doing much more virtual training virtual coaching and and now the online program that you mentioned well, a couple of things. You've always got a network arm in Australia through the My Future Business show, so you're welcome to visit any time. Um, but also, um, we're going to be talking, obviously, about the pivot that you've made. But I'd like to talk about your journey, Stephen, in terms of what you took away from it. What was one of the most, I guess, um, culturally educational components to all of the travel throughout your life? Uh, great question, Rick. And I think I can easily answer that we as human beings have more in common with each other despite our genetic roots our ethnic roots our cultural roots than differences and i I wish we would learn to focus on those those uh commonalities rather than the differences and uh, and of course you know i'm speaking here uh, to you uh, approximately two weeks after a very divisive election in the United States. We have a very divisive country. Uh, It's almost split right down the middle of about 48% of the people leaning one way, 48% leaning the other way, and 4% not giving a darn. Um, But yeah, that's that's the number one takeaway, I would say, is that we we have a lot more in common with each other, and we we as human beings just start to focus on that. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. Now, um, I'd like to, if we could, uh, give um, the My Future Business audience a... I guess an introduction to your extensive experience as an author you again you've won many awards you've covered various topics from you know basic management through to advanced leadership strategy and the list goes on and on and on I was wondering if we can maybe reveal um, your work in terms of your authorships yeah happy to you know when I my firm My career was basically in marketing when I worked for the uh, organizations I worked for. So many of my first books were about marketing, um, about customer service. And I also created a series of quote books on Asian quotes, having lived in Asia for so long. But now I've segued into the leadership space. And the last four or five books have all been on leadership. Uh, One was called Leadership Lessons from the Volkswagen Saga. So talk about the 
the governance that we can learn, the leadership lessons, the branding lessons from that disaster that Volkswagen created for themselves. But, oh, yeah. And then I wrote a fun book. Uh, one your audience, probably, you know, particularly younger people in your audience would enjoy. It's called Eight Keys to Becoming a Great Leader, which is kind of a boring title. I'll be the first to admit. But the subtitle is what people love. And it, the subtitle is Leadership Lessons and Tips from Gibbs, Yoda, and Captain Jack Sparrow. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's, that's the reaction I get from everybody. So it's, it's Gibbs from a TV show called NCIS. He's an ex-Marine sniper, very control and command type leader, but he gets great loyalty amongst his team members. You've got Yoda, your philosophical leader, always trying to understand what, what the right thing is to do and reflect and think before you act. And then, of course, just the opposite. You've got Captain Jack Sparrow from the Pirates of the Caribbean, who's your get into trouble, get out of trouble. And, uh, but he builds great loyalty, and he's a great motivator. You can learn a lot about motivational skills by watching uh, uh, Johnny Depp play uh, uh, Captain Jack Sparrow in all those movies. So it's a fun book. It's only about 140 pages, and people really love it, particularly uh, the younger crowd. What do they call it? A hook. You've most certainly yeah. got me there. As soon as I'm, I'm yeah. wanting to pick it up. Now, you've talked a little bit about um, inspiration and uh, you know having great leaders, um, but um, oftentimes we find that uh, those who are coming through the ranks, they're not. To, or at least they don't perceive themselves as, as leaders. Is leadership that something that can be learned, do you think? Oh, absolutely. No question about it. Sometimes you learn it by baptism, by fire. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly you can learn, is there some core skills to leadership? Uh, for instance, how to motivate other people, how to give re a feedback that is both relevant and actionable. Most people give feedback on, you know, sort of thing like, hey, Rick, good job. Well, that's that's nice to hear, but it's not actionable. I mean, what what did you do well that you want to replicate? So, so that there's a skill to that aspect, uh, showing people the true value they bring to the organization. Delegation is a skill, and, and how to delegate, and whether you delegate all of a all of a task or all of a project to somebody, only part of it. And one of the things that people don't understand is sometimes you need to delegate to develop people. Uh, you want people to grow develop new skills and so you have to take a little risk and delegate to them and you know they might get it wrong they may take longer to get it done but they're going to learn the first time and they'll be better off doing it the second time so it's definitely a skill people can learn something that came to my mind Stephen is uh, because of the need to pivot with everything that's going on in the world and you've moved to online uh, a lot of businesses are doing that from the, the conversations that I've had how does that affect leadership is it changing that dynamic it is. I mean, the skills are the same. It's where you deliver them. Um, for instance, just something simple like giving somebody a performance review. When, when you see somebody regularly, you can give them a performance. You see their behavior, see their attitude. You see the, how they're working, the, um, the processes that they're taking. But when you're leading somebody remotely, like we've been doing for most of this year in lockdown situation, you can only really judge someone based on their output. I mean, they, and, and so you don't know how they're doing it. You don't know if they're struggling. It also makes it hard to coach people because you don't know if somebody's struggling to get something done. And people are re usually reluctant to tell their boss or their supervisor, hey, I'm struggling. Or even, even if it's mentally struggling, if, a, if it's physically struggling, or just struggling with a task, people are reluctant to say they have a problem and go to their boss for some coaching or mentoring. So same skills, a different way of delivery, so to speak. I wonder if intuition still plays a part here or if whether or not we're needing to, um, I guess, um, rely heavily on the numbers in terms of their performance. You know, read between the lines, if you like. We've noticed a drop in your performance. Is that, an, is that a way, another uh, a tool? But that's way I think intuition is very important. Uh, I also think very interesting. I, I was talking with somebody in South Africa the other day, and, and she had read a report that introverts are actually more comfortable leading remotely, partly because they actually plan the conversations. I, yeah. you know, if I was your boss and I was an introvert, you know, I'd have to plan what I want to ask you and what I'm thinking about. Whereas an extrovert, you know, extroverts just go into conversations. Hey, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. And, yep. and, and wing it. <laughs> so, so in some ways, the uh, remote situation is better for an introverted leader. I'd love to continue this conversation about uh, leadership and, and how it leads into the online uh, education program that you've developed. But I also want to, as you know, I have a very special place in my heart for book authors. And I say yes. it, said it before and I'll say it again, there is most certainly a process behind it. And you have to be a certain type of individual to see it through. I would like to, if we could, Stephen, just spend a little bit of time on the fundamentals of writing so that those who are aspiring to write can get something away from this call. Would you mind sharing a little bit? I'm happy about that? to. 
happy to break, but I'm going to preface it with that. I'm only going to talk about nonfiction writer. I have sure. not written fiction. My father wrote fiction. Actually, he wrote novels and short stories. Yep. But the, what I can tell you is that nonfiction writing. So I think, first of all, you should outline your thoughts. And I, I use a deck of card analogy. So if I think of, of the, the uh, suite of cards, the Jack, King, Queen, and Ace, um, you know, there's four, four of those. Yep. And so I say, so I got four key topics, four key messages I want to get across in a book. And then underneath those, I want to have four to five supporting messages for each of that. Now, if I get four messages supporting four of the key messages, that's 16. 16 chapters is roughly a good nonfiction book. Now, that's how you start. I, I'll you know, be the first to admit that I move things around. It, it, sometimes it ends up as 14 chapters. It might end up as 17. But that's how you start. You get outlined. The second tip I want to share with your readers is something I learned when I was researching my book, Better Decisions, Better Thinking, Better Outcomes, which talks about how our brain works when we're making decisions. And one of the things I learned there is about being distracted. Now, I, when I write, I usually write in three to three and a half hour bursts. And I, but I get up every 50 minutes, put the kettle on and make some fresh coffee. I used to look at my emails. I used to look at my text messages. And then after I make one, I'm making my coffee. When I go back, I was wondering why I couldn't focus. What, you know, what am I trying to think? <laughs> what, where was I? Yeah. The research shows that, that it takes us roughly 23 minutes to refocus on a major task when we get interrupted. So now I put my phone literally on airplane mode. And even if they're tempted to pick it up, I'll, oh, it's on airplane mode. Don't yeah, touch it. Put it down. I go down, make my coffee. Now my brain is still thinking. What's the next paragraph? How do I segue from this chapter to the next chapter? H have I done everything I want to talk about? So the brain is still working, even though I may be standing there, you know, waiting for the kettle to boil. Uh, so that's another tip is be fully focused when you're writing or when you're editing. Now, with nonfiction, they, they can tend to be, not always, but a little bit dry and a little bit matter of fact. You talked uh, a little earlier about a title which was somewhat boring, but then you spice it up with Yoda <laughs> and the lights yeah. and his merry men. <laughs> so Absolutely. Uh, that being the case, you've, you've used a great title in your book. It's nonfiction, so there's lots of facts in there. Is there, an, is there a need to have an element of storytelling, even though it's nonfictional? I believe so, but then that may come from my classroom facilitation because I know in the classroom when you tell a story to illustrate a point, and I've used the same technique in the online training program, is I tell stories to illustrate the point. I think the same thing in the nonfiction world when you're trying to get something across to people is tell a story of how it's worked or how it hasn't worked or what you've learned from something. I think that's very, very important. Thank you for sharing, Stephen. I'm loving this call. Now, I'd like to talk about um, what you have been up to, you and your partner, since last time we spoke? Well, my, my girlfriend and I, uh, when we hit the when we hit the lockdown, we both looked at each other, and of course, I lost eighty percent of my business for twenty twenty. You know, as devastating. Soon as we hit the lockdown, yeah, devastating. Just what you know, what am I going to do? And you know, after a couple of days of, of kind of feeling sorry for myself, and and I said, you know what? And I actually had this idea for this online program last November, and I thought, well. This is this is a sign. Go execute it now. What's interesting is you know she was in a similar situation, um, and she was job hunting at the time that the lockdown hit. Now, mm -hmm. in the seven months or so, she has launched. She wrote a book and launched a book, which I helped her write and launch. A wonderful book for women called "When Strong Women Speak, Strong Women Listen." It has hundred, eight hundred quotes from women around the world hit throughout history to motivate women to be more successful. Excellent. Uh, she started a blog. Uh, she is, her part-time hobby is decorating, so she started a blog on decorating tips for the home and for the office. Uh, and she started a new partnership with two other ladies, uh, one in Colombia, one in Mexico, and they now have a new training program that they just about to land their first client on on uh, wellness That's fantastic. Uh, in the workplace. It's so, so wonderful. Me, I've done something similar. I I, I wrote another book. I I kind of took excerpts from one book. I wrote a book, published a book in June called. Um, uh, so I'm stumbling here. Uh, the book is uh, How Stress and Anxiety Impacts Your Decision Making. And it's aimed at everybody, whereas my previous books were aimed at leaders. So this is everybody's. Everyone's under stress under the pandemic, under lockdown. People need to understand that 
this stress, this prolonged stress is impacting their decision-making capability. So I, I, I published a book yep. uh, and then I created this online program, which I launched uh, at the end of October in, in 2020. So yeah, we've all been busy. <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. And you know, you talked about pivot earlier and when I hear pivot in this regard, in this context, Stephen, I think about innovation. Um, what are some of the stories outside of your own world um, that you're hearing other people are trying and what, what's inspiring for you? I, I think a, a lot of people have really great attitudes. Um, and I also think that one of the silver linings of the lockdown is people are realizing that we are social animals. And, and so they, they're being, I think people are being more kind to each other, um, being more willing um, to, to uh, talk to each other and, and, uh, and, you know, not send off sharp emails or one, one oh, sentence yeah. emails. Um, I know I've been, when I've been, the people I've been coaching, the leaders I've been coaching, uh, you know, I tell them right now, the number one question you should ask whenever you talk to a staff member is, how is the family? How are the kids doing on distance learning? How's your spouse coping? How are you both coping working from home? If you're both working, whatever it is. Then secondly, how are you doing? How, yeah. how, what's your well-being? How, what are you doing to keep your mental, physical, and emotional well-being? And then the third question is, now let's talk about business. And I think a lot of people are pivoting in that direction, realizing that, our employees are not cogs in a wheel. They, they're human beings, and we need to think of them first as human beings and understand what they're going through, and then let's talk about business and, and the results that we want to achieve. I love the fact that you've prioritized it that way. You know full well that the very first thing we both spoke about was how you're going, mate. You know, what have you been up to? Yeah. And then we decided, hey, you want to talk about business. So, yeah, that's a wonderful yeah. structure. Um, some sage advice for anybody who's on the call who's listening to this. Now, can we just go back a little bit to your latest book and unwrap that a little bit? Would you would you mind telling us a little bit about the, the contents? Well, the context is, again, stress and anxiety. It's mm -hmm. where our brain operates. And when we're in two things are to readers or listeners should understand is that first under prolonged stress and scientists are able to prove this now in the last 15 years or so through the MRI technology mm -hmm. under prolonged stress the part of our brain that controls our reactions controls our, our emotional reactions actually dis, dis, uh, disintegrates it actually gets smaller under prolonged stress and that's why you know after five six seven months of pan, pandemic lockdown we were reading reports of increased binge eating increased um, alcohol abuse or drug abuse and unfortunately even increased domestic violence yeah. and and we can't help that that is literally our brain now that's not an excuse no of course but not. that people need to understand that and I, and and those of us who have to deal with people in those situations also have to understand that you know, much like a teenage brain is not fully formed and teenagers make bad decisions and th that's simply because their brain is not fully formed. Not um, we should understand that as parents. Well, we have to understand that with our colleagues and, and coworkers that people under prolonged stress may not be, you know, may be having some issues there, um, which goes back to the point I made earlier of, of what are you doing about your personal well-being when you talk to somebody. Uh, but secondly, to just, I mean, I'm sure you and everyone listening is, is uh, or watching has at some point said to themselves, I was so angry, I couldn't think straight. Oh, yeah. And that's our emotions. That's the back part of our brain, the amygdala, which is now taking over. When we get upset, we get emotionally hijacked. And that is impacting our decision making. It impacts our decision making in our personal lives, and it impacts our decision making in our professional lives. And the, that's the gist of that book is for people to really understand. And then, of course, there's tips and techniques in that of how to get yourself in control. There's some tips on there about mindfulness breathing practices. There's tips about things you can do at the workplace to get yourself de-stressed uh, mm -hmm. or things you do at home to be de-stressed and the underlining message you know I, and here I'll, I'll go back to your question here's a story <laughs> when i lived in singapore i learned to scuba dive and i got certified up to rescue diver and the first thing we're told as a rescue diver is don't jump in the water assess the situations you see you hear somebody yelling help 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 out in the ocean you don't just jump in the water. You don't know if there's fishing nets that could tangle you up, if there's jellyfish or obviously sharks or yeah. other dangerous animals. You don't know if there's a, a current running. Uh, and if you jump off too fast, you're likely to forget one of your fins anyway. So <laughs> you stop. Yeah. 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 You stop and you assess and then you respond. And same thing our EMTs are trained. You know, that's why they're called first responders. So the underlining message of that book is we all need to become first responders not first reactors wow. when we're under stress. And now that I just showed you how the story illustrates the yeah, point yeah. of what the book's all about. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a clear distinction, isn't there, between, you know, there is. 
being that yeah. first responder and just reacting. So thank you for sharing yeah. that. Now, I wonder, given the tens of thousands of people that you've served and helped um, to become leaders and just generally develop themselves in their personal as well as professional lives, I wonder what this has done to your lifestyle and the way that you act. What is, what is uh, a typical... A lot. Yeah. A, a lot, quite frankly. I, I, you know, I used to have some socially bad habits. I used to get upset. You know, for instance, we all have trigger points. One thing that used to trigger me is when somebody was smoking and took their cigarette and threw it on the street or in the uh, grass and stepped yep. on it. And, and, you know, like, and particularly if they're like five feet from a bin uh -huh. and it just would, and sometimes I would speak out to them. Now I've learned I can't I can't change people. I need to calm myself down. Don't don't cause a scene. <laughs> your your loved ones don't appreciate it when you make a comment like that in public to somebody. And so I've changed my behavior. And also I've learned again to be a first responder, not a first reactor. Um, interestingly, also, you know, I coach a lot of people. I coached a gentleman the other day who was almost depressed. Uh, he'd been out of work for a year and he kept saying, I'm 74 years old. Uh, no one wants to hire a 74 year old. And I said, number one, take that phrase out of your, out of your <laughs> vocabulary. <laughs> cap, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you have 40 years experience. And every time you tell yourself, I'm 74 years of age, I want you to, I want, literally, I want you to smack your wrist yep, <laughs> and, yep. then, and then tell yourself, I have 40 years experience. I can do the job and I can teach others how not to make mistakes and how to do the job better. And I'm not taking credit for this, but it's a true story. The next day he went in for a second interview and the guy hired him and he started the job the next day. Wow, there you go. Because <laughs> he changed his attitude. <laughs> Well, look, there, there is most certainly um, value in experience. You can't buy it. You can't, you know, yeah. you can't buy that. You have to earn that. And that's where uh, age equals wisdom in many respects. Now, it does. It does. I, I'd love to um, see how, I guess, mindset and belief structures and changing them if they're not serving you um, feeds into your online education program, The Art of Great Leadership. Can we pivot and start talking about that program? Happy to, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> And and part of it is I, I believe to be I I think one of the differences between a good leader and a great leader and that's what I focus on in this program is a great leader has a leadership philosophy and a leadership mindset and by mindset I'm I'm thinking thinking of like for instance there was a vice admiral uh, Grace Murray Hopper vice admiral in the United States Navy and her her mindset was very simple you lead people you manage things. Now, from just that mindset, you know exactly the kind of leader she's going to be, where her focus is, and that's, and that's what I tell people. You have to know what your own leadership mindset is, and are you going to focus on results? Are you going to focus on people? Are you going to focus on people development? Now, a good manager, a good leader will usually focus on one of those three. A good manager will get results but burns their people out or doesn't develop their people. A great leader will also get results, but at the same time will develop their people and focus on the leading people and motivating people and giving feedback to people. And that's the difference between being a good manager, a good leader, and being a great leader. Can you, if you have um, three dimensions, you know, you need to worry about the mechanics of a business, but then you have to concern yourself with obviously the process as well as people, and you know what your strength is, you've done your personality profiling and you know where your strengths are, is it something that's possible to, I guess, uh, improve on? Where oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting, Rick. One of the things I do focus on both in coaching and in the program is mm -hmm. leadership development is not just about fixing your gaps. Leadership development is identify where your strengths are and how can you leverage your strengths. And sometimes, particularly for business owners or more senior leaders, it's not worth fixing your, your gaps. Uh, it's better to hire. Uh, yeah. For instance, a, a real quick story, when I was vice president of marketing at Citibank, I'm really good at interpreting research. I, I can read a research document. I can understand it. I can interpret it. I, I can build products around it. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I'm not really good at, at designing a research questionnaire. There's a science to research. There's an art to a research questionnaire. How you, which order you answer the, ask the questions in, what yeah. skill you. So I hired a guy, I hired an excellent <laughs> research guy, and he became my research guru. He did all of our customer research at Citibank, uh, where, and, and then he and I would interpret, and we had great discussions because sometimes we would interpret the data differently, and yep. that was a great place to have a discussion around. Um, but I, he was a genius, or pro and probably still is, uh, yeah. in research questionnaire design. So sometimes it's better to hire to fix your gaps rather than, you know, it would have taken me months to, of learning and instruction to 
to get to his, probably years actually to get to his level. So it's not always about fixing your gaps. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I've looked at the, the website, theartofgreatleadership.com, which is a fantastic domain. How can you forget that one? Um, but <laughs> also, uh, I've, I've checked out the introductory video. Now, what struck me was that I wonder if this is, I guess, follows the a theme of video inside of the program. What's the, I guess, the structure inside? What are people going to find? Well, the structure is, 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 is along that line, Rick, so thanks for that. Basically, I went to a, a studio, a recording studio, and I, I recorded the introduction uh, mm -hmm. for each video. Each, each, there are eight modules in the program. Uh, each one's about 60 to 75 minutes long, uh, including some work activities. So I did a two to three minute introduction of each module. I use a couple of quotes because I love leadership quotes. And then I recorded kind of a voiceover over the slides and went through. And then in the studio, I had also recorded some stories, um, much like the scuba diving story. Yeah. And then I spliced those stories into the PowerPoint presentation to illustrate the key points. And so it's a combination of voiceover plus some stories plus the introduction. And then they get a workbook and there's some interaction parts of it. And times I tell them to pause the video and go to the workbook and do the assignment and then come back. And one of the things I'm doing differently uh, than others in this program is that you can send me your workbook exercises and I will personally review them within 72 hours. So, you know, for instance, uh, there's an exercise on how to give um, developmental feedback to an employee where that you want them to change their behavior or improve something, mm -hmm. what they're working on. So you plan your conversation. Now, if yeah. you want, you can send it to me give me a paragraph of who the person is, what the situation is. I will personally review it. I'll give people comments on it, help them improve it. You know, I've, I've got 40 years experience, so chances are I can probably it's gotta be worth it in something. some way. Yeah, hopefully. And uh, so, <laughs> and then send it back to them. So it, there's an interaction part of that. And then one of the problems with most learning is they are events. You go to a three day or four day classroom event and Quite frankly, research says uh, shows that you forget about eighty percent of what you learn oh, yeah. in a month, if not more. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Uh, so what I'm doing in this program is everyone gets twenty four months, two years oh, worth wow. of group coaching sessions on a monthly basis. Now, like I said, eight modules. Each one's about an hour, hour and a half. You could do two modules a week. You could finish the whole program in a month. You still get twenty four months of group coaching session, and I'm going to keep the groups to no more than thirty people. So they're going to be interactive. You can say, you know, "Hey, I'm Rick Steven, and I, I've been I got this issue, and Bob, can can we discuss as a group, and we'll talk wow. about it in the group session." I'm going to sign uh, or, up myself. I think. <laughs> I, I hope so. I mean, interesting. Um, when I created, I came with this idea a year ago, and the concept was. How do I take the learning that I give the Fortune 500 companies, because that's where my bread and butter has yep. been in the classroom. How do I help people in smaller organizations who don't get that kind of training or, or nonprofit organizations? And I came with this idea to do this online program. Now, this was last November uh, before, before we even heard of uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And I'm keeping it price low. It's less than two thousand dollars for the entire package, oh, and wow. plus there's two bonus videos. They get an autographed copy of that book I mentioned earlier with yep. the, uh, Yoda and Gibbs and and Captain Jack Sparrow. It's an <laughs> How can we forget? Copy. Yeah. So um, um, the um, it's a really good package, but it's it was aimed at people who don't work in Fortune 500 companies and who don't get leadership training. Now, interesting enough, sometimes knock on wood. Um, Organizations, there's going to be no classroom training for most people in 2021. So, and organizations cannot wait another 12 to 18 months to, to train their leaders or they're going to lose people. Uh, so now organizations can buy this program and I'll give them a corporate discount if they buy five or more at one time. And if they do 10 or more at one time, that group coaching can be just for their own employees. So we can keep it really internal. So, you know, say somebody like a, a Telstra that put 15 people through the program. The group coaching would be just for those 15 people at Telstra, and uh, that would really be beneficial to the organization. Very tailored approach to this program, isn't it? Now, I, yeah. I, there's a couple of places I want to go, but first of all, I noticed, I think it was General Schwarzkopf uh, on this on the website. You've taken some leadership quotes from him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, are there leaders that, you, that stick out for you more than others in terms of their leadership quotes, and what's one that you can recall that really sticks with you? 
Well, the Grace Mary Hopper one is one that jumps out to me immediately about because I'm a big believer in, in uh, leading people and managing. I, I don't believe you manage people. I don't. I think it's a crazy idea. No, nobody who works for you wants to be managed. They want to be led. And so I think, and that's a mindset that goes back to the mindset change. So you don't want to manage people. You want to lead people. You want to manage processes, uh, you know, forms and uh, processes that you have to do and, and procedures and what have you. Um, let me see another an, another one. A favorite of mine is. Um, oh, oh, oh um, Peter Drucker came up with one. I have to paraphrase it because I don't have it in front of me, but he said something like, um, uh, all the good things in organization come through great leadership. Uh, everything else, uh, chaos, um, unhappiness, disorganization is all a result of management. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, oh, Stephen, I, I wonder, you know, I think to myself, if you open the floodgates to everybody, everybody will come, but then you're not really focusing on the, the target market that you're trying to serve. So presumably there is, a, a, I guess, an application process behind your online programs. Could you talk us through that? It's not so much an application, Rick, uh, as much as I really, in, and in the website that you mentioned people go to, theartofgreatleadership.com, is there are several places where I encourage people to book a phone call with me, and it's, there's a link to my calendar, book a 20-minute call, because I really want to talk to people about what are their challenges, what are their opportunities, what are their hurdles, you know, where are they in their career. I want to make sure the program is right for them. And I don't want somebody spending two thousand dollars and then after you know a couple months going, oh, God, this is over my head. I wasn't ready for this, or or I, I knew all this stuff. So that I, so it's not so much an application process. It's just I want to really ensure and, and set up a relationship with the person who's going to take the program. And so when we get to those group coaching sessions, I kind of know a little bit about them and, and know what their situation is and who they're working for. I I, I don't want a, a, a whole lot. Of, Sorry, a whole lot of anonymous customers out there, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. That's, That's the process. And with that 24-month period of time, I'm sure you'll be forging real relationships, you know, friendships almost even, um, you know. Um, so I know that you've also got another website. I was wondering if we can maybe share a little bit about that site as well so that people have a very good understanding of all of the avenues in which they can find you. Well, great, thanks. Uh, that uh, that website is is calianteleadership.com. Uh, caliente is a Spanish word that means hot, but the second definition of caliente is passionate. So a conversation caliente in Spanish means a passionate conversation, almost kind of like what you and I are having today. Oh yeah. Uh, and I'm passionate about leadership. <laughs> I hope that comes across. It's pretty apparent. So, <laughs> yeah, and and so and also the other interesting thing is where I live in Southern California. The land I live on, I, we pay a lease to the Agua Caliente Band of Indians, Agua being water, oh. Caliente, so the hot water. I live in Palm Springs where there are literally, you know, mineral water springs in the area. And so that's what the name of the Indians So, So it's a partly my tribute to our Native American landowners as well as using that little play on words of Caliente meaning passionate. So on that website, I, there's a lot of resources. I, I, I publish articles and myself, I, I, uh, my blogs on that website. Uh, there's a, I recommend leadership books on that website and also all my other programs, my basic core programs that are both classroom focus and virtual focus on, on that. You know, I've got programs about conflict management. I've got programs about team building. I'm licensed to teach a program called the five dysfunctions of, of teams, which is based on Patrick Lencioni's book that just came out 20 years ago and it's mm -hmm. a great program. I'm, I'm licensed to, to uh, conduct that program. Um, of his and so all that kind of information is on that on that website so and, th and those are really almost all those programs are aimed at corporations whereas i said the the art of great leadership is primarily aimed at individuals who want to invest in themselves or get their companies to reimburse them you know two thousand dollars for a training program uh, or now in today's world and probably just for a short term 12 to 18 months it's it's a uh, it's a solution for corporations to consider as well but the primary audience for that uh, program are individuals thank you Stephen. i've absolutely loved this call and for everybody who's on the call with us today i hope you've taken away a great deal of, of value and i will be making sure that you have access to both caliente leadership and the leadership uh, leadership skills training website 
And uh, with all that being said, Stephen, this has just been a wonderful opportunity to spend some more time with you on the My Future Business Show today. Well, Rick, I, I want to tell you, I'm, so, I'm really pleased. These are always great conversations, but I'm, I'm also really pleased that you've been successful with this program. I mean, I, I, I know I've dealt with other podcasters and interviewers over the last 12 months because of my books, uh, when mm -hmm. I was pushing my books. And, you know, some of them gone out of business, some, you know, just they floundered, they gave up, they got, you know, depressed because of the... Uh, the lockdown, I think, but I give you credit for continuing. It's a, it's a great program. I'm, I'm sure you've got a loyal listener base out there. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the call, then make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, share us with your friends, and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. And if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.